Hello, welcome to Forest Focus. It's another massive match for the Reds tomorrow as they take on Wolves looking to preserve their Premier League status for another season. Joining me to give us the opposition view, I'm delighted to say, is Ryan Lester of the Wolves Report. Ryan, really good to have you with us. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. I'm very much looking forward to the game tomorrow. Uh, I've got the feeling it's going to be quite feisty. Uh, and I'm sure you've got some questions to ask me about that as well. So, yeah, looking forward to the game. Yes, uh, we will talk about this weird rivalry that we've got. Uh, we've, got we've developed a few with a couple of teams, but Wolves is, is one of them. We'll get to that a little bit later. Just kick us off by giving your thoughts on Wolves' season in general. Because I remember back at the start of the summer, um, people who watch this regularly will know I'm friends with quite a few Wolves fans because I grew up in that neck of the woods. And I thought they'd really struggle after losing Lopetegui, um, you know, Ruben Neves, quite a few senior players. It's, they seem to have surpassed all expectations uh, from the outside looking in. What have you made of it? Absolutely. I think with the way the season start, Wolves also lost Mateus Nunes, uh, Jan Martinho, Adama Traore, um, Jimenez, Neves. There were some really senior, experienced pros, and that's a lot to lose. And then to lose the manager that had done so well to keep you up just a, less than a week before the season, it didn't look good for Wolves. Gary O'Neill came in, probably wasn't the most fashionable name, and I think he's aware of that himself. If you've been relieved of your duties at Bournemouth, then there's probably some football snobbery amongst the way, thinking, well, he's probably not good enough for Wolves. How delighted uh, to be wrong many of us were, including me, but I was prepared to give him a chance. And he, he has surpassed the expectations, so I'm, um, I'm delighted with the season so far. Um, we, it, it's fizzled out a little bit, and it's probably... The European conversation, although only a couple of points off, is still a realistic one. With the squad depth that we have, it's probably not a realistic realistic game now. But a season overall, overachieved, I think, from where we expected. If you'd have given me 17th, I'd have taken that at the start of the season. So to be around the mid-table of doubled Spurs, doubled Chelsea, beat Man City, I can't really argue with that. Uh, well, if you give me 17th now for Forest, I'll definitely <laughs> take that. Um, like you were saying there, it feels like, just looking at results recently, it's one win since the start of March. You had that FA Cup quarter final against Coventry, which, you know, uh, topping that Watford defeat at Wembley must be hard, but that was pretty brutal, that Coventry game. Um, does it feel like a good time to play Wolves, the few injuries as well, or can we still expect another really tight game on Saturday? Despite the season drifting out a little bit, no one's ever, since those players have been out, no one's pumped Wolves or dominated them. It's always quite tight. I mean... The main midfield pairing, the, the three main defenders, the wing backs, all, all the first choices should be in around the sort of the midfield and the defence and the goalkeeper. So that shouldn't be an issue. It's putting the ball in the net and creating that's the problem. So um, I don't think Wolves are particularly easy to play against, although they're lacking in firepower at the moment. So um, without obviously Neto, without a fully fit Cunha, without Huang Yi Chan, without Jean Vic Nabelagard, there are some big names there that. that that are missing, so Wolves will be a little bit blunter at the top end. But the first half against West Ham last week, Wolves were clearly the better team and had restricted West Ham to nothing and probably should have seen the game out before half-time, but they didn't and paid the price for it. So although Forest have probably got more of their pace and power available than, than Wolves have, I'd still expect a tight game. Was that a bit of a freak game last week? Because I think Bowen scored from a corner, West Ham had a pretty rough VAR decision, you had a pretty rough VAR decision. Was it just one of those games where it, it, you know we can discount that sort of? Um, I think West Ham would probably value for their two goals in the second half. They were the better team then. Um, but they were able to bring on Antonio, Aaron Cresswell at right back, Johnson, sorry, Cresswell at left back, Johnson at right back. They had quality subs to bring on, whereas Wolves could bring on Matthias Cunha that's, that's not fully fit. He's only just recovering from a hamstring injury. So he only had 25 minutes, half an hour, and you could see he's not quite as sharp as he was at his peak. So... Um, I'm reluctant to say it was it was a freak game, but I mean, I, I spoke to Keith Hackett on our podcast last night about the disallowed goal. I don't know if you'd seen that, but sometimes I just I think I understand football, and then I don't. I don't know if the, the keeper's going to turn into an eight foot octopus and put his arm in the top corner from from a two meters out. But yeah, I think it was strength that got to Wolves. Um, the depth that hurt Wolves in the end, and West Ham still had depth, and they probably have a, str a stronger squad depth wise. So. Yeah, I think a draw would have been fair. Excuse me a second. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned VAR. A few of our fans I saw a couple of days ago were dubbing this the PMGOL derby because <laughs> you've had awful decisions. Going back to that first game against Man United, we've yeah. had terrible decisions. I mean, obviously the Willy Bolly sending off against Bournemouth sticks yeah. in the mind, but we've had a series of them and so have you. <laughs> What's your what's your take on VAR this season out of curiosity? Um, I've always been pro-VAR. 
But um, as each week and each game, game as by goes on, I mean, obviously, you're going to have a certain amount of bias if it's your team that's been affected. And that feels like it's there are way more negatives than positives from being a, a Wolves fan this season in terms of VAR. Yeah, as you mentioned then, the opening game of the season, Anana has come out and tried to punch the ball and he's punched Sasha Kalajic in the face instead. I don't know how that isn't a penalty. I think the fact it's at Old Trafford probably helps. Um, or helps Man United certainly didn't help Wolves and there's been multiple decisions throughout the season. So I have a real issue with those using it, not the technology. I think it's the inconsistency. I mean, for example, the when something so key happens, like the Willy Bolly second yellow card, you've got the first yellow and then, and then the second one. When you're, you've got to send someone off here a second yellow card, in my mind, you have to be 100%. Because if you're not, you can, ruin a, you can ruin a game and you can inevitably in someone suspended for one game as well. So it clearly wasn't a second yellow. I mean, at the time, when you see it in real time, quick, you can see why he's given the yellow. But VAR would have cleared that up. VAR would have said no. So therefore, if it is, for me, a second yellow card and it, that, to a red, I think that should be reviewed as well because it's still a huge decision. And if you, you lose a man and you go down to 10 men, Forgive me, I can't remember the score of that game, but that's a huge loss going down to 10 minutes in a game like that when a simple saying, yeah, we can use VAR for second yellows would have made a change. So for me, I, I still think the technology is good. I think it needs to be reduced in terms of a bit like cricket and a little bit like tennis when you get a certain amount of calls because otherwise we're, we're, over, we're being forensic with absolutely everything. You can't celebrate a goal properly. There's 10 minutes of stoppage time. It's taking away the spontaneous emotion and celebrations that you get when you, when you score a winning goal or even score any goal now. Some of the guys I go with who are on my podcast as well now, we don't celebrate goals as much as we used to because you just never know what's around the corner and it, it's heartbreaking when it happens. So I could do a VAR rant for about an hour, to be honest, Matt. But yeah, um, good technology in to use correctly and I, I don't trust those who are interested with using it. No, we lost that Bournemouth game three two incidentally in stoppage time, uh, which was, <sighs> and we we also had a rough decision at Old Trafford when Rashford won a really cheap penalty that that would not have been given if it was the other way around if we were the ones appealing. So yeah, there you go. Um, it, obviously Nuno's in the dugout for us. I'm trying to think: would Spurs have faced Wolves when Nuno was in charge? Or is this the first time Wolves fans will come back in yeah, face he's, to face he, with him? Yeah, he Wolves face Spurs uh, twice. And Nuno, and I think Nuno won both times, so he's got a pretty good record of coming back against Wolves. Um, I have ultimate respect for Nuno. I think him and Wolves going their separate ways when they did was the right thing for Nuno and for Wolves. I think football works in cycles with players and managers, and I think they both come to that time when they both need a, something a little bit different. Um, but Nuno, under the guidance of, of Fosun and Ruben Neves and Raul Jimenez and Jan Martino, gave me, probably my best five or six years supporting Wolves, European quarter-final, FA Cup semi-final, consecutive sevens in the Premier League, European football, some electric performances, kept breaking quickly with Diogo Jota, Raul Jimenez. Some great times, so um, I, I respect Nuno, but uh, I, that, that respect, respect will be parked, on, uh, firmly parked on Saturday afternoon because uh, I want to win that game and hope, hopefully it'll be the same for everyone else. It's His relationship with Forest fans, it's not weird, it's not it's slightly ambivalent, I think, at the moment. I think he's yet to win people over because we've had a few good results and a few bad ones. How did he win Wolves fans over out of curiosity? Because he's not the greatest messenger no. of the media. Was it through results purely? Yeah, I think so. I mean, having done, done a bit of media work myself and faced him a few times, he's he's quite cold in the media and he's not going to come forward and give you something exciting. He's almost sort of media train within an inch of his life because you get the mm. same sort of answers. You get you get words about solutions and finding answers and, and doing things better. And I understand that. I think he had some bad experiences in, in, in some of his previous role with the media. So I can understand why he's a bit protective. But sorry, I digress. Going back to your question, um, when you're in the championship and you've got Ruben Neves and Diogo Jota and you, you get over 90 points and you win the championship, I think it's hard not to love the manager. The football was good. It was almost too easy at times, but when you were blessed with almost Champions League players playing in the Championship, um, it just it just all fit fit together. I mean, he had a classic Nuno had a dream song, which was fantastic, which was echoed out for sort of, sort of five, four or five years. So um, it was just a, a massive sort of romantic year where everyone fell back in love with Wolves, and Nuno was the man taking the credit for it. Obviously, with the help of George Mendes bringing in Neves and, and Jota as well. So yeah, and then we went on to that finished seventh in our first season back in the Premier League. It was, yeah, I think going from your point of view, though, when I know 
Steve Cooper is highly regarded by a lot of Forest fans and still is, and I know some of them still don't think he should have he should have shown been shown the door. But when you've following the footsteps of a man that's taken you from the depths of the Championship to the playoffs to the Premier League and kept you up, I think that's really really hard step, really hard footsteps to follow. So I don't, whoever followed Steve Cooper was going to be it's going to be hard to find the same love for a guy that has transformed the club from a team that might be going to League One to find themselves in the Premier League. So despite being a big name that's managed some big teams, I think it's it's going to be a tough job for Nuno to because he's not Steve Cooper, is he? Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, I'll see how this season shakes out. I do think he'll he'll keep us up and then we'll probably go from there, I, I hope. Um, talking about Wolves, team news, and you've mentioned a couple of players. Cunha has been uh, a big miss and a big revelation. I see Craig Dawson's missed, uh, I think, four games in a row. Wang Chan, you mentioned, and Ray and Nori, who seems like a player who's playing at a different level this season, went off at the weekend. Are you expecting any of those to start this one? I think Craig Dawson failed a fitness test for the starting line, um, but I think he'd be in and, in and amongst it. Um, Dawson's very much a stopper. He's somebody I'd want marking Chris Wood because he's very, I mean, at Molyneux early this season, he, he bagged Haaland. He, Haaland didn't get a kick. Dawson just sort of had him in his pocket the whole game, which is quite an achievement. But Dawson likes playing against big, strong centre forwards, and that's when you see the best of him. So if he's back fit, I'd imagine that'll be the man to deal with Wood. Um, Ain't Nori, I think he was coming to, coming to the end of Ramadan, so I can understand his, his limited minutes and his fatigue. Um, but I do believe he had a little kick on his calf. I've not heard anything since I'd expect him, but as you mentioned, the levels that he's been playing at this season, particularly the last few weeks, make, making goals, scoring goals, winning penalties. He's one of the most talented left wing backs I've ever seen, probably our most gifted player at the club with the ball at his feet. But he's moved into more an advanced position and he looks fantastic. So... Um, Bellegarde's knee hadn't settled down. I don't know if he's trained this week. Um, Hwangi was in contention to be in the squad this week as well. So I think there'll be a few. I think the bench will look stronger for Wolves. I think it probably could. It could contain Dawson, Cunha, and Hwang. So um, maybe Dawson starts. But it, it will certainly, if the game is tight and hopefully Wolves are still in it, which they should be with half an hour to go, the introduction of Hwang and Cunha will be a, a huge, a huge lift, particularly if, if, if Forrest are trying to. Trying to win the game, or if they're pushing to pushing on. Yeah, well, I think they have to probably. Um, what, what are the areas you think Wolves can hurt us? Then, I mean, if Wolves can take a decent corner and put the ball in the box, they've got a chance with our set piece record. If you've seen <laughs> it this season, but in general, from open play, it, it, especially if those players don't start, are you looking at uh, Jao Gomez? I'm trying to think of who your forwards are actually without those. Players. Yeah, so, so Jao jo Gomez will be sitting with Mario Lamina. Um, up front, uh, the guy that opens the door, he doesn't seem to, sometimes he'll have really quiet spells, but if he's in a position to take a corner or a free kick or he's got an opportunity to find a through ball, Pablo Sarabia's magic in his left foot is absolutely wonderful. He scored one of the goals of the season earlier on against Spurs when he took it on his right foot and volleyed it with his left. A minute later, he's found a through ball for, for, for uh, Mario Lamina, who's in a late burst into the box. I don't see Wolves pressing Forrest. I see... Wolves inviting Forrest on, and then that probably go against what Nuno wants to do because he'll want to he'll want to tuck in, absorb, and counter with the pace that you've got left and right. So, I think it'll be very much a, a tactical game of who blinks first. Um, I don't I don't see we're playing straight into Forrest's hands because of the pace you have left and right. It would play into Forrest's hands. I'd be very surprised if Wolves pressed. I think it'd be a game to to tuck in and frustrate. Tommy Doyle did well last week, playing more of an advanced. He was very neat and tidy on the ball. Um, I think it'll be, for Wolves, it'll be a game to stay in it. And then, as I mentioned, then bringing Cunha and Huang on later on. Otherwise, Ain't Nori will be the man to stop. But he's on the form at the moment. He looks like he'd go past anybody. He was dancing around West Ham players and dancing around pretty much any player that's been in front of him this year. He's a player that isn't afraid to take anybody on. He's predominantly left-footed, but he can go left or right. He's got this weird sort of dummy and chop inside. And he's either been fouled or he's gone past you. So... Yeah, it'd be interesting. Danger man for us then, creative, in terms of creativity, it'll be Pablo Sarabia. And hopefully, or I'll say from a Wolves point of view, Huang and Cunha probably from about 30, 40 minutes to go. Uh, you've disappointed me saying they'll sit in because I don't know if you saw the Fulham game, like they just left space in behind and we, we really picked them off first yeah. half. So, well, it's, yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, we're just talking as two fans. I think that's really naive for Fulham to do that because... Clearly, I mean, I watched your game at Boxing Day at Newcastle and watching all of that counter-attacking masterclass when Chris Wood turned into 
I don't know where that pace came from, but it was a phenomenal performance. But it was classic Nuno counter attack. I was like, I've seen that performance watching Wolves so many times, tuck in, absorb, counter in with pace, almost unplayable. You're playing into Forest hands, and I'm surprised whether it's an arrogance fr- from fr- from Fulham doing that. I don't know, but that sounds really naive. Why would you play into the hands of a team that wants to counter attack you? So I'd be surprised if there's a lot of space in behind Wolves on Saturday, but hopefully I don't egg- end up with egg on my face now when they, they press high. What are the <laughs> yeah? I, I think you're probably right. Sadly, um, what are the weaknesses of Wolves then, where we can get at you? Because every game a bit between the two teams has been very tight since we got promoted. Uh, are there I any think... areas we can hurt you? Um, I'm not particularly concerned. I think it's more of a case of Wolves hurting themselves by not taking their chances, which they should have done in the first half. Defensively, I'm not particularly worried. Or or in midfield, I mean the pairing of Joe Gomez and Mario Lamina. If they're both fit, that. The, mil- the mobility and strength of that pair in midfield is enough to combat anybody. And they've nearly five man City. Uh, that's been the pairing that's doubled Spurs and double Chelsea. So I'm confident about that. Um, Wolves don't really make it easy for anybody. They might not always play well, but it's always tough and they're competitive. And there's there's a lot of fight and a lot of belief. And it always stays nil nil one nil. So I think it'd be about taking the chances. And if Forest have got a full forward line and they get more chances, that'll be where. So. I don't. I'm not concerned. I'm more concerned that they don't have the firepower to start the game, whereas Forest have got firepower left and right and an in, and an informed Chris Wood. Yes, you come on to my next question. You mentioned Chris Wood a couple of times. Obviously, he's you know the form player in the Premier League in terms of goals probably at the moment. Even though if he did miss uh, that big chance at Spurs, is he the one that you would worry about? Or um, we'll, we'll talk about Morgan Gibbs White a bit more. But is there anyone else from Forest that you're looking at? Well. Chris Wood always scores against Wolves. So there's already Forest have already scored in my eyes because he's just one of those players that always scores. Every club's got them. There's that one player that always seems to score. Now, he um, he scored a hat-trick for Burnley at Molyneux at the end of Nuno's reign when Burnley beat Wolves 4-0 at Molyneux. And, I mean, that was a painful day to watch that one. But Chris Wood, Chris Wood flicked his Ronaldinho button and just absolutely battered Wolves um, like he did away at Newcastle. And there was nothing we could do. So I just feel like he always scores. Um, but I'd rather Chris Wood playing than you're the centre forward who is really strong and really quick. I think that that's the kind of player that would hurt more Wolves than, than Chris Wood. But he's a good player, isn't he? You know, he's he's a Premier League veteran now. He knows where the net is. He's probably not the most fashionable of footballers, but he does a job. I mean, it, it was a bad mess away at, at Spurs, but he keeps finding the net every other week. So. Yeah, credit credit to him and Wolves have got to be careful because if if you feed him, he will score. Mm. Let's talk about more Gibbs White then because this there seems to be a, a a weird rivalry between the clubs since we got promoted, and I don't know if it's all Morgan Lopetegui was a pretty fiery character, and his staff and Cooper's staff didn't get on at all. Uh, both have gone now. So, um, what's your take on that rivalry? And do you expect it to be as as spicy uh, tomorrow or not? Well, from a fan's point of view, I hope it is because I think it adds more to the game. I like. I like that fire and the tension and that because I think that it makes for a better game than a, a sort of a safe. And if you've got a couple of pantomime villains playing, I always think it helps because the team, one team will really support that player more and the other team will really sort of get on that player's back. Morgan had, I think, plenty of chances at Wolves to impress. He did have some alleged early discipline issues in terms of training and timekeeping, that kind of other things. Um, so... And I think he left Wolves under a bit of a cloud as well because Wolves did, whether they were playing the game to try and get a big fee and they, they did get a massive fee for him in the end, I don't know. But that cup game, when they seemed to be in the faces of, of Joe Martino and, and players that had sort of trained with him since he was a kid, I think there was a little bit of lack of respect there. And obviously you give that, I'm all for that because if you give it, you take it. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure if it goes wrong, the Wolves fans will let him know. And I'm sure if he scores, he'll do that again. But um. I just think there was a, a lack of class from the player that the that in that situation when he first faced Wolves at, obviously back at the City Ground. Um, so yeah, and I think that transfer itself created a little bit of needle because there was quite a lot of people on social media from the Forest side taunting Wolves. We've got your best player, da 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 da. We didn't actually think that, and I don't think he was our best player. He was a young talent that capable of a magic moment in a game that could turn a game in a second. However, there's a player that also that will try 10 passes with the outside of his foot, frustrate you when he's taking free kicks. But he's that player that can get the ball into his feet, the little flicker will trick, he'll open up a goal and you're like, wow, that's magic. 
But the other 90 minutes, you're frustrated with doing, not doing the basics well. I don't know if that's the same player that you see now. Um, what, I don't know. What, what, what's, what, what's your take on Morgan? Yeah, it, um, it has been. It has last season less so. More see more this season. Early early days this season. The flicks and tricks really frustrated fans, and a lot of fans want him taken off corners and dead balls because we we just we don't look like scoring from them, and um, they're very samey, which I think is more of a coaching thing. They're always hit in the same area. Um, so yeah, but um, as you say, like Fulham at home, he. We all play, every player played well, but he he was the the architect that won the match, and he does have that that magic in him, and he's also got that swagger, which I think probably comes back to what you're saying with you know the fingers in the ears thing, that ego that I think you need as a number ten to take an attack on your back, and I think that's what he's what he's got. I mean, do you think we overpaid? Because I think if we do sell him, we're going to make a profit, and some Wolves will see some of it as well. But yeah, I think, I think we paid around thirty million in the end. Is that yeah, too much he... for? Not? I, th- I think I think it's it, I mean it can go up to I think it can go up to something like forty two million, but I think that involves in England caps and European football, which probably isn't going to happen just just yet for you guys. But I th- I th- I'm pretty sure now it's I think it's up to sort of early mid thirties in terms of add-ons. I think one last year was staying up. I think yeah, another, it's like there's, five there's, million. I think. Yeah, yeah that's so. Um, I think it's a fair price for us both. Steve Cooper worked with him in the past. I think he worked with him at Swansea and in England at, under seventeens. Morgan's clearly a talented footballer. He he's an eye opener. He could have a ball in between three players, and he's finding himself breaking through. And he's got that magic in his feet, but he's frustrating. So I, I I was happy with the price, and I'm happy that I think Wolves get. I think Wolves get. I can't remember what it was. There's a, there's a small sell on uh, for any profit, so it's not not of the whole deal. So I think anything we make over of what you what you've paid thirty million is is money to Wolves, which is good. So. Um, I'm really excited to see him come up against Joe Gomez because Joe Gomez is our no-nonsense Brazilian sort of... He plays like as a num- number six or number four. That guy does not suffer false and he's an opportunity to, to, to give you a... Re- drop a little reducer in there, you will. So that'll be really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Not many people get past Joe Gomez very easily and that's why the likes of Man United and Arsenal are, are sort of touted to be looking at him in the summer and we don't really want our players to go, but... When you have good young players and you're a, size, they're a club the size of Forest or Wolves, the big boys come swooping. So I'm very much looking forward to that battle. Um, and I hope, obviously, from the Wolves' point of view, Joe Gomez wins. But it'll be interesting to see the silk of, of and the tricks of, of Gibbs White against the uh, thou shall not pass mentality of Joe Gomez. So I'm very much looking forward to that. I do think that's a key battle. It's interesting you say that because he, he had a similar challenge against Fulham with Jao Polina, who I said on our podcast is up there. You know, you've got Rice and you've got Rodri, and then I think you've got Jao Polina not not far behind him, and he really took him to the cleaners. So, and w- one of the things I should have said about Morgan is it's interesting what you said about his, you know, youthful exuberance, shall we say, if that was the case. He, he does seem like a really mature character now. I know he's become a father, and uh, he seems to love it in, in Nottingham. And he's a leader in the team. He, he wears the captain's armband if Ryan Yates isn't playing. So, yeah, I do feel like he's a key man. And if we lose him, then, um, yeah, I think we'd really struggle to replace him. Uh, yeah, we've got Murillo as well, who I don't know if you've seen much of, who's the other yeah. big sellable asset. But I think he's easier. Is he, um, is he the guy that keeps shooting from inside his own half and nearly scoring? <laughs> incredible. I think he- that yeah. shot at Spurs was absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I mean, I was I was watching it obviously from a neutral point of view, and I think I've had a few Spurs players in my dream team, so I didn't want the goal to go in, but I you'd have had to have applauded that. And he's, I think he scored. I mean, he hasn't scored yet; he'll probably score on Saturday now. But so he scored tomorrow now. But it, audacious effort, absolutely audacious. But um, yeah, looks a talent. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I, I had a doggy in my fantasy team. Um, so um, Spurs defenders never going to get a clean sheet. <laughs> I know, I know, it's terrible. <laughs> I keep cleans this double game, these two double game weeks they've got. But yeah, the Spurs players are actually killing me at the moment. I had Madison. <laughs> I had Madison. I had to get rid of him. He he would ruin, ru- set me back my, massively. Um, Interesting. I'd like to get a neutral perspective on the relegation battle then to see how you think it's shaping up. Obviously, Everton have had the two points deducted this week. Brentford and Palace are in pretty terrible form, but ostensibly it looks a lot like it's between us and Luton. What's your take on how it's going to end up by the end of the season? Um, from a neutral point of view, I'm glad no one's cut adrift because I always think, I know it's other people's pain and I've been there as a Wolves fan myself uh, under sort of like the, the Mick McCarthy era when you're battling it out with still games to go. I mean, it's fascinating at the, the, bot, the bottom and the top. Um, I've got a soft spot. I know, you're not going to like this and your listeners are not going to like it, but Rob Edwards used to play for Wolves 
And I played mm. a few charity games with Rob, and he's such a good guy, and he's done an incredible job. So to, for them to still be in the conversation now, I think he's an incredible achievement. I think my outside danger here for going down is Brentford. They are on absolute free fall. They're in so much trouble. They could get drawn in. I mean, I don't know where... <sighs> If I had to pick now, I'd probably say it's going to be Luton that are going to go. But it is so fascinating. I mean, the whole points deductions here and there and everywhere, for me, it's an absolute joke. There is, There should have been written black and white of what the deductions are, not based on opinion or an independent panel. Now, my opinion is, if you've done wrong, then you need to face some kind of punishment because Wolves sold like £150 million worth of talent last season and... They have had to balance the books for overspending the year before, but they've balanced the books and now they've made it. So it isn't fair on teams like Wolves that have had to do that when others getting a bit more flexibility. I think there has to be a punishment, whether that's Forest, whether it's Everton. But the way I think it's been dealt with has been has looked really amateurish and it's like there seems to be a lot of consistency. So am I for the punishments? I think they should happen. I think so. I think it's only fair on the teams that are, are staying within the parameters of the guidelines. Um, but I just think it's been handled so badly. I think there needed, there needed to have been actual levels of what you've done. Uh, this is the rules you've broken. Go across and that's the punishment, not a panel to, to have a look because if you're having different panels to be doing that, you're never going to get the same answer and it's not, it's not fair on either. Uh, I don't want teams getting relegated because of points deductions. That would be really poor. Um, but there has to be some kind of punishment and management because if, if teams break the rules, as I said, it, it isn't fair on teams and particularly teams like Wolves that have had to sell half their team last season to stay within the guidelines. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's fair. This is a, a wider question about Premier League football. Obviously, I loved it last season because I hadn't experienced it for 23 years and, uh, you know, it felt great. This season, I haven't particularly enjoyed and part of that is PSR, part of it's VAR and it feels like the Premier League I don't know. It just feels like that commercial behemoth more than the football league to me right now. Is the novelty kind of wearing off for Wolves fans? You've been here quite a while now. I guess I'm not sure if I've phrased the question right, <laughs> but is, does, has the Premier League lost some of its magic in the last couple of years? Uh, I think so. I, I mean, I wish I could read out my tweet I put out yesterday regarding this because of the talking. The government are talking about bringing regulators to the Premier League, um, and I pretty much went on to say, well. If you don't want the regulators, you need to do better because the, certain, the level of inconsistencies and the the unbalanced behaviour of the discipline actions feel don't feel right. Um, I'm all for as well sharing out the prize money because the, the pyramid of football is important. It's not too long ago that Wolves and more recently Forest were, were in the second tier and Wolves were in the third third tier of football and and 30 years ago, they're in the fourth tier of, of English football. So I think it is important that some of that wealth is spread out because I don't want teams going bust. That's not, and obviously, the Premier League should get the most money because obviously it's the big league, but I think it's really important we protect our pyramid. Um, but there's obviously regulators going to come in for a reason. So again, I digress because I love talking about football, but um, has it is it less enjoyable? Well, Wolves aren't as good for a start, so it's not as enjoyable when you haven't got Jimenez and Yotta at front flying at teams. But in terms of the fan experience, VAR is really taking a shine off. I mean, the lads on my podcast, Noki and Tyler, that come on each week, they're the same as me. It's not quite the magic now. Now, we go to games for the social to have a beer, have a bit of a laugh at each other's expense and watch our football team. But it's as much as for the social, it is for the football now. So, yeah, I, I think VAR in particular, and maybe I'm talking as, talking as a suffering fan because of what's happened so many times this season, but... That moment of madness, so that pure ecstasy when you celebrate a winning goal now, you can't do that anymore unless it's a penalty at the end of a game or the full-time whistle goals. But goes that that last minute moment of euphoria when nothing else matters and you go to football and your arms and legs and all of a sudden then you just, whatever worries or stresses that you've got are gone because you've got that moment of ecstasy. You haven't got that anymore. And that's a real shame. But the TV companies are quick to show the fans going mad and they want to see them singing. But you're going to lose that soon because people are going to get they're over, being over forensic with every goal when it, when it should be clear and obvious. But anything, they're just looking for absolutely everything. So to go to the basic question, it, it, for me, it isn't the same. And that's a real shame. I'm sure for the wider world looking round, 
the Premier League is amazing and everyone enjoys it. I enjoy watching being as a neutral, but as a fan, as a club, I, I sometimes now it's just it's just painful. Um, just before we come to get your final thoughts on the game, a quick word for our sponsors, the Trent Navigation. Really uh, appreciate their support. Uh, it's the new match day experience uh, at the expanded Trent Navigation where we held our live show last night. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. So uh, get down there if you can pre-match to enjoy the game and then post-match it's the Oasis and gig that I've publicised so much. 5.30pm straight after the final whistle at the City Ground should be a really good evening and thanks for their support as ever. Um, just finally then, Ryan, just some of your thoughts on the game. I've kind of said it a couple of times, but every time we've played Wolves, it's been very close. I think you beat us there when Brennan missed the penalty last season and then the other two games were draws. It feels like it's going to be like that again to me. How are you feeling about it? Yeah, it's it's not a derby. And I mean, all games mean something, but because of the needle, it feels like it means a little bit more. And I'm looking forward to it for that reason. I, and I mean, I, I don't know what it's like this season, but when Forrest fir first come up, like when Leeds did as well, I respect that the noise that the home end makes because you don't get that from a lot of Premier League teams. So I don't like or dislike Leeds. I don't like or dislike Forrest. But I can respect teams. And the noise coming out at Forest was good. The noise coming out away at Leeds, probably the bet, the noisiest I've seen in the Premier League. So that's one thing I respect and I'm looking forward to because I, it's like, well, well this is, we're, in a, we're in for a game here. This is really good. And I enjoy that. The game itself, I think, will be tight. Nuno is no way going to throw the kitchen sink at Wolves. And I don't see Gary O'Neill coming forward as well. So I think it'll be a really tight game. Nil nil or one one nil either way. On my podcast last night, I went with um, Wolves staying in the game and then Cunha coming on winning it one nil late on. Um, I'd very much like that to be the case, and I've got to give that as my hearty prediction. Hearty prediction, but um, yeah, I think it'd be a very tight game. I would very much not like that. <laughs> yeah, I do think I do think it'll be a tight game. God, we really need to win. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the other fixtures, but Luton go to Man City uh, at the same time. And Everton have got Chelsea, although that's a really easy fixture at the moment. So, yeah, could be one of those big swings. After last week, they really pegged us back. So, yeah, looking forward to it. It should be a close game. As ever, if you've enjoyed this, do us a favour. Hit like, hit subscribe. Uh, you can consider becoming a channel member. And I do enjoy reading all the five-star iTunes reviews if people would help us out with one of those. Right, uh, we shall be back tomorrow post-match. Um, going to the games will be a bit late. And I'm meeting some Wolves friends afterwards for a beer i think so it's probably gonna be about eight drinking with the enemy i know i know well pretty much i'll say pretty much i'll be at the trent navigation <laughs> so say hello to a few people there do come and say hi to us and then yeah post match with the enemy as ryan said uh ryan thank you very much really enjoyed that matt i'm sure we'll be talking again next season because I, I don't think forest are going to go down i hope so i hope so and i think you're right uh, and obviously like I say, lots of Wolves fans who I know. My, my, my brother's a Wolves fan. He used to be a season ticket holder. So, uh, yeah, I, I do have a soft spot for Wolves, uh, even though a lot of our fans don't, as we discussed earlier. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much for everyone's company today. Uh, enjoy the game tomorrow and hopefully catch you post-match. <laughs>